So one day is Thursday, February 16, 2023, and this is the week in charts. I actually want to thank all you guys and girls for attending. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. If you're watching a recording of this on YouTube and would like to watch it live and participate, bring your stock picks and any questions that you may have about trading, and I'll answer them on the fly, go to davelander.com slash webinar. Register if the week is the link is the week is old. <laughs> the link is old because it probably will be, but it will bring you to the current webinar. Also, if you uh, I might not be doing a show next week due to some uh, traveling that I'm going to be doing, so you may not uh, you may not see a show next week. Just an FYI on that. And uh, also on Thursdays, you can usually find on my homepage. I put a banner ad up when there's a show and a countdown. And once you register for one, you register for all. So what are we talking about? Well, current market conditions, your questions on trading, your favorite stock and crypto picks. If you don't mind, wait till we get to the live charts for that and ask about one at a time. And that's for your benefit, just so I see your, your uh, request. But you can ask all the questions you want uh, right now about anything else. And then, again, hold off on your picks. So kind of had a lot of uh, little things to cover tonight. Uh, I want to do a crypto update. Again, it's not about the crypto. It's it's funny whenever I'm really pumped up about crypto, it the market begins to tank. <laughs> so I put the gree gree on it. And actually, as I put it together my presentation, I started shorting a whole bunch of pairs. So I want to continue my conversation on it's not about the crypto and kind of work that into trading in general and money management and market selection and all these other good things on things of that nature. Uh, I want to do a brief update on the intraday trading, and is it worth it? I don't know. And that'll make a lot more sense in a minute. So it didn't have a good week, at least so far, with that. Uh, getting some questions on ogres, so I want to talk about that. And then uh, a question here or two on IPOs, so I want to flesh out the $5 rule. We also have a, a TFM 10% update, but that might go away, and I'll show you why in just a few minutes. That's the uh, market timing system. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as often summing up, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Thanks to Greg Morris for giving me that little quote. All right, so this is my intraday trend trading experiment. I guess I've always done a little bit of day trading. Way back in the day, I used to day trade futures, and that was when they just had the big contract, and that was a pretty scary thing to do, and that'll make an old man out of you really fast. And since way back then, I've mostly done things like uh, the Russian doll type of stuff. And I've talked about that. And occasionally at opening gap reversal. And over the last, I don't know, a couple of years or so, I've been experimenting a little bit. And lately, I've been talking more and more about that with uh, intraday trading ETFs and more of the Russian dolls and things like that. And when I started going public with this, initially, it did really well. And then it sort of... Uh, the wheels kind of came off the bus and we'll get to all that in just one second but anyway as i've been doing lately and the purpose of this right here is to show you what happens when you have a trending market versus a choppy market the last week we had a really choppy market for the most part and and by the way i know i've been saying i'm going to start fleshing out some of the things that i'm doing once things start working a little better i'll flesh out more and more but basically if there's one of the four ETFs that I tend to focus on, and that would be Gush Drip, LabD, LabU, SoxL, SoxS, and JDUG, and JDUS. The commodity ones can be a little trickier, especially Gush. Gush, I have a love-hate relationship with that one. I love it, and it hates my account. But anyway, if you have one of those that has really good relative strength and looks pretty good, then you sort of want to try to be in those. The bottom line is, for the most part, sans the commodity indices sometimes, or sans, let me rewind that. For the most part, you want to pay attention to what's happening in the indices with the exception of the commodities. And even the commodities will kind of follow the indices quite a bit because they're part of the indices if you think about it. But anyway, the reason I want to show you this and I'm showing you this a lot was, I have been showing you this a lot, is because if you take a look at like the, last what day was that last friday okay the market opens it goes up it goes down and it goes all around and it created a situation where i sort of chased my own tail and i also want to flesh out over time some of the mistakes i've been making too and i think that's important to show you 
how I'm getting a little too caught up in some of this stuff. And on Fridays, I tend to play the short dated options and I can get myself in trouble. And that's part of what happened on, on that particular day. Now, Monday was okay because in general it did trend and but it didn't it didn't set the world on fire. Most of the trend was sort of early in the morning and then it kind of chopped around. So I didn't do much on that day. Now on the 14th, the markets gap lower, sold off, took off, imploded, and then took off again. So that was not a good day to try to catch an intraday trend. And the idea is to get in as early as possible once a trend is established and then ride it all day. So you can see a little bit better day on, I guess that was uh, Tuesday or Wednesday. And then today it kind of took off and then it drifted and then it imploded and I lost money today. And I actually made a little bit money of that money back. It was worse than this earlier. And I made a little bit money back when it began to implode on the short side. So here's the intraday profits since I started going public with this. And one thing that I've thought about and seeing this in graphical representation, I counted little dots here. So that's roughly about one month. So one month, all that energy I put into it, I've actually ended up less than where I started from a month ago based on the on the uh, on the equity of the profit, the P and L equity. So I thought that was kind of interesting when I was just kind of slugging along and just kept, you know, day after day after day, for the most part, pushing higher. I'm like, boy, this is easy. <laughs> By the way, whenever you say that in trading, you know, you're getting ready to get whacked. I kind of had that feeling this morning in crypto and uh, today started great in crypto and then started kind of slowly kind of, uh, I wouldn't say come unglued, but didn't didn't end as great. And again, now I'm short some, so we'll see what happens there. Anyway, I've been saying this a lot. A lot of these things are just kind of um, reiterate. If I let the market come to me, things tend to go well. I have some stress issues I've been dealing with lately as far as uh, my body is concerned. My upper body is really tense. I don't know if it's the it's the hyperactivity that's doing that. Also, the shiz coins have been taking up, uh, I wouldn't say an inordinate amount of time, but a lot of time. And then they're also, like I'm in here, on and off uh, throughout the night, sometimes looking at these things too. So that's kind of adding to it. And as I've been saying quite a bit, when you say yes to something, you're really saying no to something else. And your Tim Ferriss's and your motivational people of the world will tell you that. And I've noticed that a lot. It's like when I'm saying yes to the shiz coins and, and kind of trading them like a madman, I might be saying no to some other opportunities that are out there. So you got to be really careful. So if I'm doing doing this um, intraday trading, I might miss a position setup. And that's where my bread and butter is in catching those longer term setups. And then it's also a chance to put yourself into a state of regret. You're like, oh, maybe I should scratch this position because it's not moving in my favor. The market's kind of dull. And of course, as soon as you do, the market takes off. If you don't do that, and I've been trying to be more and more hands off like I did today, then of course the market implodes and, and, and you, you regret it, kind of like I did today. So you gotta be careful, not chase your own tail. And then uh, a couple of weeks ago, I kind of stepped on the gas a little bit because I got a little too full of myself and that was a bad mistake. And I've, I've since backed off from that. And then again, as I said earlier, saying yes to something means saying no to something else. So I'm trying to weigh all that stuff and figure it out. And there is a potential, again, to chase your own tail and end up in that kind of a negative spiral with things. Uh, as I've been saying, it's it's been kind of an amazing fractal learning. Fractal, one of you guys brought that up a few weeks ago, which I thought was a great way of putting it. And my my writing has, I wouldn't say incredible, but I'm kind of blown away a little bit. I'm a little full of myself when I look at my writing from the prior day, or sometimes at night, I'll go through some of the writing that I did early in the morning. And it's it's putting me through all these psychological cycles. So the psychology is really coming out. And one thing I've, I'm kind of noodling with a little bit is the secret to trading, or one of the secrets to trading is getting the reps in and getting the trades in and getting used to buying things that are going up and selling things that are going down. And I think that the 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 intraday trading can do that and maybe some of the hyperactivity with the with the shiz coins could do that. 
the the danger is if you became if you become too entrenched in that world, then you're never going to be a position trader and be able to hold on to positions longer term. And and I get that a pure day trader comes in is like Dave, I want to make the transition to longer term position trading. And so far, I don't think I've had any that made it. <laughs> uh, to my knowledge, if you are a day trader that's that's moved to longer term time frames, let me know. So that is the one danger of it is that you you become so hyperactive that you can't stick with anything longer term. Uh, tape reading is is kind of helped out uh, quite a bit. Uh, I, I I I'm learning that a lot of times. You go back to some of those charts, which just chop it around. I'm like, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna fight with them. I'm gonna let them fight it out. And that's been kind of a cool thing. So anyway, uh, less is more. I got to figure that out. When the market is going is is in a route going just one direction, I can do really really well, and I know when to to kind of press a little bit and all that. But it's when it's choppy and it's difficult. It's like you you got to learn how to stop trying. And, and all these are all these micro lessons can really turn into macro lessons. So that's why I haven't given up just yet. But uh, I do miss my life a little bit, like I've been saying. And, uh, you know, it's like earlier today, somebody had dropped something off on the front porch. And I went to the front porch and I got stopped out of three positions on the way to the front porch, the way back. It's like, what the hell, you know? So I need to work on that. And I'm working on it. And as I learn the lesson more and all, the less is more. And those other lessons, I will start bringing them to you. Okay, uh, let's shift gears and talk a little bit about IPOs, unless there's any questions on that. So I have a $5 rule, and it seems like every time I violate it, I get my ass handed to me. And in this particular case, I did not violate it, and I was actually a little bummed out at first. This is LICN, and it almost actually got the $5. So I was on the fence on taking it. I think had this close a little higher my animation didn't stick so had this close a little higher i would have taken it but when you are trading the buy at b pattern you want to buy on the five day closing high so that would be this closing high here unless the high for the week is set on day one so here you can see day one it made its high and let's just assume that's friday which i don't know if it was i'm sorry monday I don't know if it was or not, but let's say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So the earliest you would get into an IPO would be on Friday, five days, the close of the fifth day. <laughs> By the way, somebody said, Dave, why you always beat the dead horse? Because I guarantee you, I'm going to get 10 questions asking me about an IPO that came out yesterday or the day before, okay? <laughs> or the day before the day before. And so I, I sort of find that if I don't keep repeating myself, I have to answer more and more emails. I suppose to just say, go in and watch the week of charts. I, I said that for the 15th time. <laughs> but anyway, so day one rule means it also has to close above day one high. So it closed around nah, 475 or something like that. And I was very tempted to, to buy it on that close. But it was a little, it, it had come off its highs and I didn't like the way it was coming off. Now, here's the thing. If this was a higher price IPO, I might have taken it even though it's come off its highs a little a little bit. Maybe I was kind of picking it apart. And then I was kind of bummed out when it when it took off the following day. But what's interesting is let's say you did buy at that close, and this is what happened. And I was kind of watching it started to implode on the close. And I really didn't want to take it anyway, like I just said. And when I saw it kind of imploding a little bit, I'm like, eh. I just didn't I didn't want to do it. And and that's the, the thing about trading. You have to you have to make a decision, obviously, and you have to live with it. And you have to time travel too. And and one thing that I'm working on is is the pre-mortem. We always talk about the post-mortem. After the trade is done, you go back in and you look at what you could have done, what you should have done. And there's always going to be a hindsight bias to that, but there's actually a foresight that's already there that you might not see. And what I'm trying to say there is how many times you go back and look at a setup that you took and then you think, what the hell was I thinking? So if you can kind of time travel and say, well, I would just shrug my shoulders if this thing failed miserably, then take the trade because you know that sooner or later, some are gonna work out. Now there's always gonna be a hindsight bias, obviously you can't do anything about that, 
but a lot of time you could really look at that chart and and say you know what this really isn't that great somebody was sort of giving me some constructive criticism on the service and they said that that I'm I'm super selective I'm waiting for that perfect setup and I think they were saying it as a bit of a criticism, like, why don't you show us more setups, uh, shallower pullbacks and some other stuff. And I actually took it as a compliment because I want to try to pick the best of the best stocks and I don't want to settle for mediocrity. And sometimes I know after three or four weeks of no setups and I'm really looking hard to try to find setups, I kind of want to force that issue to happen and I have to stop myself. But anyway, I did think that had you taken this trade, I think it makes for a great money management example because overnight you're up about $1,000, okay? Let's say you did 1,000 shares. That's a 25% move on this stock. And I know it, the math kind of gets a little fuzzy when you look at it, lower price stocks and percentages. But 1,000 bucks is 1,000 bucks. If you took just, you invested, your total margin on this would be less than $5,000 and you made $1,000 overnight if you want to look at it from that perspective. And just from any other perspective, you know, $1,000 a day is $250,000, $252,000 a year. That's much better than a poking eye. So I think you had a bit of a gift horse with this one. And if memory serves and somebody might remember, I think this thing was up even more and after hours trading. So maybe you could have flipped out some for a limit. But notice toward the end of the day, this thing imploded. Well, it imploded like right after the open. But upon its implosion, notice that you would have been down 2460. And that's a pretty big, that's a pretty big pill to swallow overnight, especially if you did more than a thousand shares, obviously. But that's 2460 per 1,000 shares. So you can see without some money management and taking this gift horse and that's kind of like a another lesson kind of in there like you know you've got that big gain overnight and and and, and we're all guilty because you get that big gain you're like yeah it's gonna go even more you know so that's fine but just have a chair ready whenever you reach it for your calculator a lot of times you might want to also reach for your mouse and lighten up with some chairs so and here's the way i think about it too it's kind of like okay now, if this thing just kind of starts blowing and going and keeps going up, keeps going up, keeps going up, and you're, you know, you're 1,000, then you're 1,100, then you're 1,500, whatever, then by all means, trail a stop on half of those shares and look to get out at a higher level. But as a general statement, don't look a gift horse in the mouth, especially with a low price, and I think this is Chinese, yeah, it's Chinese IPO. So this thing, obviously, crazy is cray-cray. Even ludicrous would say that's ludicrous. Anyway, any questions on buy at B or $5 rule or anything like that? Okay, we have some questions this week. And by the way, one of you guys asked some questions and I actually uh, covered some of them in the Trading Simplified show, which is on my website homepage. So you might want to check that if you're waiting for the answers. And my apologies for not notifying you of that. Okay, so this was a question about WWW, and I didn't I didn't read it all the way through. I just initially assumed that he was trading the recent pullback in this stock, and he actually got in a lot earlier, so we'll talk about that too. And he wanted to know if his trailing stop was too tight. And, you know, it's really, all trades eventually end badly, okay? You either get stopped out, or you hit the IPT and it comes back in, okay? You lose money on those open profits and you break even, barring overnight gaps, of course. Or you ride the trade for a long, long time. And in the end, you give up a sizable hunk of it. I was looking at some of some of the older trades and I was like, wow, I thought I made like 40, 50,000 on that. And I mean, I'm not bitching, but it was like, it was much less, like, you know, 10,000 less or more because we did have that big drawdown in the end. And that's what trends following is all about and if you got out every time you had a drawdown provided of course it didn't hit your stop then you would never make any money longer term and that's one of the tough parts about trend following so when i looked at this i thought he was talking about the recent little pullback that we had this pullback right here as you can see and the first thing that i noticed was a ton of overhead supply and then we had this gap implosion right here 
okay? Now, when you're looking at the charts, you're reading the mind of the market. You're reading the psychology of the players, and you're trying to figure out what's going on in their head. You read the emotions of the market, but at the same time, you embrace because you can't control your own. So when I see a big gap down like that and an implosion, the first thing I'm thinking is there's a lot of people that are caught on the wrong side of the market and they're looking to get out. And then all that overhead supply also, there's a lot of people that are still holding a stock from that overhead supply. And one thing that's a little strange is if people are holding the stock, a lot of people or most people don't sell the stock on the way down unless they're forced out for some reason, okay, or unless they're a trader, they get stopped out. It's a different thing. But we're just talking about the masses. They tend to sell on the way up, believe it or not, not on the way down. They want to get whole and they want to get out and they want to feel like, oh, I'll never do that again. So if they bought this stock at 17 or 18 and it gets back to 17 or 18, they're out. They're, they're going to break even. They're going to forget about it. So you want to think about what's going on in their heads. But anyway, this was pretty nice little persistent trend here. And it was about a 65% run, just eyeballing it. So that's pretty good. And a fairly deep pullback. And first little pullback after this nice little run higher. So I would say that that's a decent setup. Unfortunately, it had a lot of problems. Now, he had he had had the wrong date in there. I think he actually fat fingered a one in, in 23 instead of 22 or whatever, whatever the case was. Uh, it, no, it was 11, some, 11, 9, 23 instead of 1, 9, 23. So I went back to 1, 9, 23. And you could see there was a gap here. So I would immediately throw out a setup with a gap. And then, of course, this big fat gap here stared at me and bothering me. And you notice that it gave up almost all of its little breakout, so to speak, that it tried to do from those lows. So that is not a setup that I would trade. Okay, so there's a gap against the setup and there's no actual trend. Now he said he was looking at a um, kiss ma goodbye. Ma is the moving average, MA. And I think that was published in the Layman's Guide to Trading Stocks. If you go to DaveLayer.com slash free book, you can get a copy of that for free. Anyway, so when you look at the longer term chart, and lately I've been using the 30 EMA a lot more than the than the, the, the 20, but they're both they're both good moving averages to use. You can see it almost kissed that moving average. And down here, this is just a, a count of the days that it's above the moving average, not the magnitude. And I've tricked up a lot of people on that on the back in the website in the in the Q and A uh, after the um, or the the test I should say after we talk about trends. I asked the question about magnitude. It's, no, it's not magnitude. It just tells you how many days you've been above that moving average. So this is 27 days from right here. And that's usually a pretty good trend. Once you get to 10 to 20 days, it's usually a decent little trend. And the setup just looks for a pullback to that moving average. Now, I just eyeball charts for my moving average pullbacks instead of actually putting the moving average in. Sometimes the moving average is in there if I was looking at something else. But most of the time, I'm using a blank chart. But the reason I, I developed something with a moving average, especially with the Landry light, is to make it a lot easier to recognize. So you say, aha, I have these lows greater than moving average, it's Landry light, and then we've got this little illustrator down here. So, hey, I've got 10 or 20 bars of Landry light. This thing looks like it's in a trend. Always look at the market too, by the way, and make sure the net net price move is higher. So I'm gonna wait for it to pull back to the moving average for my setup. Now, as you get better and better at chart reading, you don't have to wait for the moving average or whatever, but this makes it easy to recognize and also for those who want to scan for something more specific, a little easier to scan for. So if you put the 20 day moving average in, which I think the original Kiss Ma Goodbye was based on 20 day exponential, you could see you had a nice little run higher in here and then you come down to kiss the moving average. So notice below the Landry light count goes back to zero when you hit that moving average, okay? 
And you see this particular case, it rallied out. Now, if this was just a chart in and of itself, it would probably be a decent setup. But as I said a second ago, it had a lot of problems a little further back. Okay, any questions on that? Oh, the other question was, uh, it was two points. And back when he bought in, I think two points is enough uh, wiggle room for something like this. And then I'm not sure exactly when he got stopped out, but probably somewhere in this pullback. And that's fine to get stopped out. Now, what you do want to do longer term, as I preach, is you want to slowly let that stop loosen up, especially if you're getting into something at a lower price, because as that price moves higher, your price move is going to increase on a point basis, okay? So you might get in with a 20% stop way down low, but then that might only be, well, in this case, it was like two points is what he used. So as that moves more and more your favor, let's say you're 10 points in the money, well, I think it easily correct a couple of points because that means it's at 20 and 30 and $40 a share. Very good problem to have. Okay. Um, I forget who, I think Brian asked the question. Brian, are you here tonight? I don't know if I really got to your, your answer on the volatility of the stock, but in that case, just kind of eyeballing, I think two points is probably was probably a good a good amount of room. The only thing I would I would just reiterate and, and watch would be as it moves more and more in your favor, start letting that stop loosen up. And and it's gonna suck in the end. You know, I've got I think it's on the trading full circle or something. It's like yeah, I've got a little old lady looking at a, a laptop and she's all shocked. And like that's the moment you realize how far your stop is away in that longer term trend following. You just have to learn to live with it. And as I said 10,000 times, people um, people complain about the profits given up following the methodology toward the end. You know, it's like, hey, I only made 40,000 instead of 50,000 on this thing. You know, it's like, okay, well, send me $40,000. Go get a massage with some of the money, as I've said, a nausea. You know, and, and forget about the trade. If it's stressing you out, then, then by all means, send me the money. In 20 something years doing this, I've never gotten a check from somebody, at least for that particular thing. I've gotten some thank you checks, which I'm very gracious for, but nothing like that. So it comes with the territory. It's, uh, what was his name? Mike Moody was talking about something and, and uh, momentum and stuff. And I said, hey, I can't solve for the streaky nature and some other things. And, and he said, well, Dave, if you're going to have a baby, you're going to have a lot of baby poop. You know, it's like, so that's kind of like the baby poop that comes with trend following is you will have to give up some of those profits in the end. And as I've said a thousand times, um, who was it, Eckert? Uh, Dennis, well, Dennis and Eckert were okay. I think it was Dennis with the Turtles. It seemed to be okay with, with giving up open profits. Like if they, you got into a position as a turtle and you were very profitable and you gave up some of those profits in the end, he really didn't worry about that too much. But if you got into something and you were giving up uh, if you had outright losses and you weren't stopping out, then you were in a lot of trouble for that. So he was basically trying to teach him how to follow those trends and then live with the with the baby poop of trend following. So he did. Oh, Brian says he went out at 14.54. Yeah, you caught a pretty good trend and something that that um, really wasn't a good setup. Okay, and so uh, well, Dave, you can't argue with my success. Well. You got to be careful because the market, as I preach, can be a, a bad teacher. He went to three ATRs. So I get asked this question a lot about average true range. I don't I don't use it per se. I, I eyeball the stock when I'm setting my stop, okay? And if you were to quantify all this eyeballing that I'm doing, yes, it would boil down to like an ATR. My only problem with statistical measurements, and, and believe me, they help you because I look at HV and things like that. And, you know, I got my volatility wrong on, on a Russian doll setup, and that's part of one of the, the negative things that you're seeing in that intraday trading. That could have been much, much, much better had I really paid attention to how volatile the stock was and had my stop a little looser. By the way, I fix a lot of people for free by telling them to loosen their stops up a little bit and maybe trade smaller share size, and then they eventually start catching more and more trends. And that's part of the reps too. You you need to get some success under, under your belt and not just 
make a bunch of trades. But uh, yeah, so I, I'm, you know, I, I, I would have to look at it a little bit more, but I really don't think it was a trade that should have been taken, certainly based on my methodology. And to me, it kind of looked like a little bit of bottom fishing, but uh, you know, it worked. So save that money or put that money aside or put that money towards your next trade, but don't let the market teach you to do that again is what I'm trying to say. And I think Brian, I'm not, I can't remember, I get everybody mixed up every now and then, but I think Brian said it was okay for me to give him tough love. So, um, and beat him up. <laughs> Usually uh, when somebody starts asking questions in the group, my Facebook group, I'll say, uh, I'll say, are you okay with tough love? <laughs> Cause they used to tend to kind of nurture quite a bit. And in doing so, I think I, I think I prolong the inevitable where you really have to just kind of, you need that tough love and you need to be like, hey, don't take those uh, mediocre setups anymore. Anything that looks like electric cardiogram. Okay, so ogre hunting. I could ask a question about an ogre. And this was the Facebook post. And my Facebook group is Dave Landry's Trend Traders, but you have to be at least a gold member of DaveLandry.com to participate in the group. I want everybody to have a little skin in the game. I also want everybody to have access to all the courses and ideally the trading service too. If you're a member of the trading service, you get the gold for free. I want everybody to kind of be on the same page so we can sort of go out and, and help each other with the methodology. And it's okay for some of you guys, obviously, to do what you want to do, do whatever you want to do. And I can learn a little bit about other methodologies too from the group and everybody else can. But for the most part, we we all want to have a bit of this trend following focus with the short to intermediate term trading and hopefully much, much longer. But anyway, the question was on a stock that's an ogre. In my reply, I showed that it was a bit of electrocardiogram. And this is what you want your opening gap reversals to look like. You want a, a nice uptrend, ideally a persistent uptrend like I drew here just by accident. And then you want to see that gap happen. And then of course, turn back in the direction of the trend. So I grabbed this slide from a while back, I searched through my uh, ogres, and I had a recent ogre trade that I can't find, and it's a losing trade, so it's not like a, it's not like I'm, maybe I'm not excited to find it, but I wanted to show you, it was kind of a mediocre type of setup, and I took it anyway, and I knew it, as I said, I think last week when I took it, because I felt like it wasn't good enough to show the group. I think deep down, I felt two things. One, that it could fail, likely and uh, number two i didn't want to look like an idiot in front of everybody in the group and number three i didn't want to hurt people in the group by showing them something that was sort of mediocre at best and i kind of whenever i kind of start doing that second guessing I, I really need to listen to that little voice inside of my head but anyway this was not a huge ogre and this is one that i did put out in the group as you can see i said tesla ogre not a huge one but an ogre and you can see in more recent times or whenever this was done back in whenever the whenever this was done, January 23, does that make sense? Was that just a month ago or less than a month ago? Wow. Anyway, it was in a pretty serious downtrend and it pulled back. And then you can see it did make that gap higher. So obviously when you see a stock going down like this, especially in a persistent trend, you know that there is supply. Okay. Markets can only do three things. They can go up, they can go down, and they, they can go sideways. And whenever you try to outsmart the market, come back to that and remember that. So obviously, if a market is going down, there is supply. So you can see when you have a gap higher like this, there are people that might be looking to get off the hook, okay, bail out. And you can see it turn back down. I prefer playing ogres to the upside, but I will also scan and look for downside ogres. Yeah, Brian said it was okay to give him tough love. Fantastic. He said he started out with a 1.5 ATR. Again, I don't use statistical measurements. Easy for me to say in and of themselves. But basically, we're coming to the same point because he started smaller and he did let it wide now. So good job on that. Okay, what about TSLQ during the serious downtrend? During December, could we have made a lot of money in TSLQ? Um, 
Rick, yeah, probably. The the only thing I would caution you with, with with a short ETF, you have a you have it. It's kind of like a due to like a martingale effect. You have like a downside bias. Let's say that you've got a short short index ETF. Might be easier to explain. And the market goes down a whole bunch. Okay. Well, they have to come in and and short that market again at lower levels, and they keep doing that and keep doing that and keep doing that. And if you plot these inverse ETFs, you'll notice that they all eventually go to zero. But what they do is they reverse split them. And as I've said a thousand times, they will reverse split you to death. So a day trade, by all means, TSLQ would be a great thing, a great way to get short. Tesla, I was looking at that today. I might have, I don't know if I fired up a trade on that, that or not. I might have. And it, it's a great way to go because I'll often forget about that. I like to just outright short most of the time on these things. But yeah, it's a great little instrument for that, especially if you just, you know, you're in a hurry, something, bam, just fire up a trade just to get some short side exposure if that's what you want. And Tesla, but again, you don't want to hold these things longer term. And that was another question. That I, that I had this week and not enough time to get to it, but somebody was asking me about, what about pure swing trading ETFs and in their inverse ETFs? And I would say no to that because you could have these huge opening gaps overnight and you could get crushed. A pure short-term trading, pure short-term swing trading doesn't really work in my opinion, which I know is redundant because I'm saying it, I don't have to say it in my opinion, but in my opinion, it doesn't work because every night in you get whacked and you're not making enough in between. The only thing I've figured out that works at least longer term is the swing to intermediate term trading where you're taking those partial profits and trailing those stops and the free rolling, which we're gonna talk about in just a few seconds. And then at the other extreme, the day trades can work provided that you're really vigilant with your damage control. All right, so Rick, Rick says he understands, but you can see in this case it did have a nice little reversal from that and you know it all it looks pretty easy in hindsight right and sometimes it is you know if you are willing to look at a daily chart and pay attention but you can see that this stock never did take out its high that's that's a beautiful type of ogre situation so if you you get it in one it begins to break down a little bit a lot of times you can put in a stop with a little wiggle room above that high because it's no longer an opening gap reversal at that point. It might reverse later in the day, but you can go in and stop out at a fairly small loss on a position like that. So this is what it looked like intraday. It had gapped higher and then it imploded. And very rare, rarely are they this textbook, but it can happen. And if you go in and look at the weekly charts from whatever week that was, get the date off the chart, I, I did flesh that one out a lot more detail. Now, a lot of people ask me about burning dogs. Burning dogs is a, a term I borrowed from Linda Rasky. And if we go back to that Tesla chart, I noticed there was one on the chart. A burning dog would be when you get a gap down like this to low levels, and then you're trying to pick a bottom. I would recommend you not do that unless you're in like an index or something like that, but an individual stock. In general, it's probably a bad idea. I mean, of course, it would have worked on this day here. But if you start looking at the chart, there was probably plenty of other days like this one here where you would have gotten clocked on that. So I would recommend trade in the direction of the trend only. So this is one that from a while back, but you could see this stock had begun to really implode. It began to pull back. It had the mother of all gaps higher. And we're looking to play that reversion to the mean move, the opening gap reversal move back into the direction of the trend, okay? So you don't wanna fight the trend with these things, even though there's probably a temptation to do so. Now, you wanna make sure the stock is set up. This is one of my favorite longer term examples or older examples. You can see the stock was, in a longer term uptrend, it was also accelerating in that uptrend. And it was also in a nice persistent uptrend, meaning that it tends to go up day after day after day after day. 
and as I'm going to touch upon in a few minutes, it was also a well-known company, a thick company, NY, a NASDAQ company, but still a, a thick Cree semiconductor. So it's a well, I mean, I've heard of Cree, you know, 40 years ago or whatever, especially back in my computer days. So it's a well-known company, meaning that there's going to be a lot of institution, institutional support. And let's say you're an institution, this thing just looks fantastic and it's not in your books and you see it get smashed overnight, you might go in and pick up some shares at a bargain, so to speak, okay? Or if you're a trader and you're trying to beat the VWAP for your client, this is like a gift horse. Also, the market maker, when there's some shitty news that came out, comes out, probably like this one, bad earnings or whatever the case may be, what will happen is the market maker will bring that stock down as far as he can because he's got to buy it from you, you trying to unload a turd on him, right? And he's got to bring it down so low that he could bring the stock up, so to speak, later in the day, or he knows that stock is going to bounce and he can flip it out later. So if you're planning these open gap reversals properly, and they don't have it happen every day, by the way, you have to wait and wait and wait and wait. And that, that one that I lost money on was because I wasn't waiting. I got a little impatient. And I knew I knew going in I was doing the wrong thing. And that's that's another thing I've been thinking about a lot. It's like you, sometimes you had a little voice in your head, that, that little bit of doubt, and you have to learn to listen to that. But anyway, in a case like this, the big fat stock, it was set up or in the process of setting up. So it was a nice little pullback in the works, a little shallow, but getting there, right? And then you get the bam, the big gap down. And of course, the big blue arrow was pointing higher. There's your gap down. And then it proceeded to take off. That's one of the better examples out there. But that's a that's a textbook example of what to look for. And like the like the counterfeit currency detectives, and I forget which one of you guys told gave me that, but I've, I've taken that ball and, and ran with it or run with it. Uh, but the the counterfeit currency see detectives they they studied the genuine article they don't look at a bunch of monopoly money as i've said quite a bit they look at a real dollar and they look at the thread they look at the little strip they put in or whatever the, all the stuff they've been adding in more and more recent years and when they get one that's a fake it sticks out like a sore thumb so i would encourage you to study charts that look like cree for your opening gap reversals just study charts that look like cree in general for your for your regular trading now, this was the, the opening gap reversal I was asked about, and you can see it's an electrocardiogram at best. So this is a stock that should be avoided at all costs. So this was the opening gap that happened a few days ago that he was referred to, and he didn't take the trade, thank goodness. And that's and that's the other thing, too. You know, not that I'm the grand poobah and, and don't hold me liable, obviously, because everything I do is for educational purposes only. But if you're thinking about a stock like this for an opening gap reversal or something, throw it out in the group. And a lot of times you guys, your other guys will, will pick up on it before me and you'll chime in with the exact same thing that I would say, because you guys have been around long enough to where you know the methodology, you know how, how I think, you've listened to me beat the dead horse so many times, you've had your ass handed to you with mediocre setups and, and you'll answer ahead of me. So that I think that's one of the hidden benefits of the group, especially if you're newer to trading, is throw it out to the group and let us noodle with a little bit you know, uh, hold us harmless if it doesn't work or if we keep you out of a trade that, that takes off. But there's a lot to learn from each other. But anyway, so that was all over the case, old, old place, all over the place, and was obviously electrocardiogram. So just a couple of thoughts, a well-known stock with lots of volume. It's kind of just the opposite. We're kind of looking for as a general statement with the the, the trend trades, the TFM trades, we're looking for inefficiencies. We're looking for the next big thing. Right now, we're looking at an AI stock, okay? Uh, and we we just triggered in yesterday or day before yesterday to a crypto stock. And then China stocks were hot not that long ago. So we've got one China stock in the portfolio. It's not doing so well just yet, but maybe that recent wave will continue. So that's what I'm looking for, whether it's coal or a meme stock or a Chinese stock or artificial intelligence or crypto, 
or whatever the church or what's happening or what's happening now or dot com back in 99 so that's what we're looking for we're trying to find that inefficiency and we're trying to find that next big thing but we're we're not doing the research like oh ai is going to be the next big thing or crypto is going to be the next big thing we're just saying hey these crypto stocks have bottomed out and they're making these nice little bow ties off of lows these nice little first thrusts some of them are in bona fide uptrends now and have pulled back i think it might be worth a shot now again everything that i just said clean persistent trends accelerating trends and other trend qualifiers in the direction of the trend so if it has like minor gaps in the direction of the trend that would be a good thing. Minor gaps against the trend would be a bad thing. Now you want to have a sizable gap. Notice I showed that smallish gap in Tesla that worked out nicely. That's okay, okay. But if it's a, in general, you want a big enough gap to where a lot of people are kind of in oh shit mode, okay. To where a lot of people are like ready to just. Uh, throw in the towel and then all that all that selling just exhausts itself and then the market just kind of it's like a vacuum like a ball being held in the water just comes right back okay examples from today dd og maybe power okay we'll take a look at those i want to talk a little bit about russian dolls and as i've said before a Russian doll is just like a little doll inside of a doll, and a little doll inside of that doll, and then a little doll inside of that doll, and then a little doll inside of that doll, and then another little doll in there. Well, I'd be that's ridiculous. Not maybe not that many, but you get the idea. And so what we're looking for is a fractal. Now it's not a fractal, a fractal. So you're looking for a pullback, but then you might be looking for a breakout intraday within that pullback. Okay, so you have the the wind in your sails, so to speak, and you're trying to catch an intraday trend. Now, what was pretty cool is, and believe me, if it was like this every day, you'd never see my fat ass again. Now, also, a little hidden lesson in this, and I'm actually watching a crypto screen in the background here. <laughs> Truth be told, but I caught um, Sophie from this list, I think, and I might have lost money on another one. I think I lost money on AI because I didn't adjust to the volatility. That's the one. But as you can see, with some of these moves, uh, double-digit moves, or close to double-digit moves, this is sizable enough to where you could have you could have made some pretty good money on these Russian dolls. Now, obviously, it doesn't happen every day. But I just want to show you that it can happen. And so this is a Sophie, which is a crypto stock. And you can see it had a nice little pullback here. And then it took off nicely out of that pullback, okay? And what was the size of that move by the end of the day? That was seven and a half percent, which is plenty enough to make money on for an intraday trade. So you can see here's the actual trades that I took on that. I got in at 696, and I was looking for uh, uh, I think 30 cents, and was a little shy of that, but I went ahead and took it. So I just put a thousand shares on. I mean, this is kind of S and G stuff. Flipped out some here, and then on the close, it just happened to be the same exact price. And I don't have it drawn in, but obviously my stop goes to break even when I hit that IPT. And I actually trail it intraday too. So if I was looking for 30 cents, I would put an automated 30 cents trailing stop in. I would put a limit order for 30 cents above my entry. And when it started getting really close, again, I went ahead and bailed out, didn't want to split hairs. And anyway, let that stop just do its thing all day long. So this would hit fairly quickly. So I left it alone and let it do its thing that's the that was my ultimate goal originally when i started messing around with a lot of this intraday stuff was put the trades on and let them work and and a couple of years back if you go in and watch some of the presentations when i talked about intraday trading i literally would put on the trades put in my orders and i'd go for a bike ride and i haven't really done that lately and part of that is because i've got so much going on i'm doing two shows every week and that's there's a lot to do two shows every week and then there's the catch up in between believe it or not i do prepare for these shows <laughs> anyway i ended up exiting uh near the close on that one and you know it didn't set the world on fire but 270 bucks better than the poke in the eye and i have been a little gun shy lately with these um with these intraday trades obviously 
Now, again, as I've been preaching, the secret sauce, because nobody can predict the future, is to get that small profit out, okay, that swing trade profit, exit half of your shares, okay, and then look to stick around longer term should the market move in your favor. Now, a quick, uh, so keep that in mind when we get to crypto, that slide's a little out of order, but that'll make sense in just one second. Just a brief TFM 10% system update. The buy signal for this means you have to be above the buy line and the buy line, which is called Landry percent of close in ACP, is just 10% off the 50 week closing high. So this was the 50 week closing high for a long, long time, right? And then after we got past 50 weeks, this was a 50 week closing high and then this one here. So you can see the buy line caught up to the market and we've got two bars these are weekly bars above the 50 simple moving average 50 week simple moving average so tomorrow we could have a buy signal in this and then i was as i was going live tonight i was thinking well i need to tell you guys that even though it's this, this mechanical system i'm going to be a little leery on taking it because it looks a little weak the market looks a little weak i'd much rather buy on strength and then as I notice, it looks like we're right at that buy line. So any additional weakness would put us back below the buy line and it would not be a buy. So pay careful attention tomorrow to this because that signal that's building might not happen. All right, let's hop into the, to the crypto. And it's been saying quite a bit, it's not about the shiz coins. This was one from yesterday, and my trigger was right here. And you can see I'm just doing trend following more on stuff, okay? We got a nice little thrust higher, followed by a pullback. My entry was there. Now, I'm not doing a lot of volatility analysis on this. I think longer term, maybe I should. But what I'm doing with these position trades like this is I'm just multiplying by 1.2. So I'm looking for a 20% gain. And it did hit it today. So now I have a free roll. So I exit half of my share. Same exact thing I do with stocks, okay? So now I'm free rolling. So if this thing goes nuts over the next few days, a few weeks, a few months, I have a free position, so to speak. And that's the secret sauce to trading, to trading stocks, to trading commodities, to trading whatever you want to trade is getting in for a limited potential loss taking some profits just in case that's all you get and that helps keep you in the game if you scratch out on the remainder and the real money is in that longer term second loaf so you can see there's a trade down there i'm just doing like nickel and dime stuff with this i wouldn't invest a fortune into crypto i knew some people who were doing these huge trades, and I just think it's kind of crazy. It's way too volatile for that kind of stuff. And it's funny with crypto, it's kind of like I was thinking like it was uh, two years ago when everyone was really, really hot. It's like, man, I was just printing money, printing money, printing money, and all of a sudden that became real money. Once it becomes real money, it becomes a little harder to trade. Much easier to parlay a small account than parlay a bigger account because you really start thinking, like, holy crap, I could have bought a boat with what I just lost, <laughs> you know? Anyway, here's another example. This is RNDR. I think I'm still in this one. Let me just shift over here for a second. Yeah, I'm still in this one, and I have a, a stop in place. But you can see it, it triggered in, same sort of action here. Now, this one I bought on leverage in a futures account. By the way, the best broker that I've found for crypto is KuCoin. And as of today, I am an affiliate. That does not mean I'm recommending them that you can't lose money with them, but if you need to get access to a lot of pairs, use KuCoin, and I'll put my affiliate link in the comments below. It's gonna cost you nothing. In fact, you might even get a bonus for using the link, and I would appreciate that. Uh, you know, just tread lightly with, with, uh, with, with any brokerage because it seems like most of them have gone out of business. But according to KuCoin, one out of every four accounts is with them. 
So they have something going on. They've been around for a few years, but buyer beware. Anyway, nice little 10% gain here quickly. So, so when I'm using leverage, futures, or margin for these things, I use uh, just a 10% IPT is what I've been using lately. And then I'm bumping the stop to break even. And my thinking is, if they pop, they might, they should keep on going. And if they don't, I can just scratch out. At least I make a little bit on it. And right now they're like a bus. Another one comes along every every few minutes. So that's the IPT. Half was sold, and then I'm free rolling on that one. Now I found this slide earlier today, and this is what the whole point I'm trying to get to is these purely emotional markets. Okay, markets that wouldn't know fundamental for him yet in the ass. And it could be the dot-com stocks. It could be IPOs. Remember the SPAC crazy stuff, the SPACs, as some people call them, SPAC. I saw one today. It was up, uh, it de spac today, and it went up 40% or something like that. I wish I'd have seen it ahead of time. Or crypto, right, could be your best friend. And we're traders, right? That's what we do. So as I've been saying quite a bit, I know some people I respect and they've been poo-pooing Bitcoin and crypto forever. And yeah, it might all be a farce, but who cares? Okay. If if you're that adamant against it, then short it. I'm short one, two, I'm short five of them right now. I might shut them down before we go to bed because the short side is a little more tricky to trade, obviously. But I'm not afraid to go short or long. And my thinking, at least back when I made this slide, this might be a year or so old, or back it was the last time they ran. Probably could put the Grigri on them and put the brakes on them and probably stop them in their tracks. But if you miss this as a trader, what else are you missing? And I'm not trying to sell you on them, okay? They might all be crap. You might lose all your money, right? So tread lightly. But boy, it's a great way to get the reps in and it's a great way to make a little money in the process. Now, You'll probably write eventually, okay, a lot of this stuff blows up eventually, right? These AI stocks that are hot right now, I already saw memes today making fun of AI stocks. They had other stocks that were like with the death walking by them, right? And, and then that was the next door that death's going to is the is the AI stocks. Well, I don't know. You know, if it's if it's a fad and whether whether it becomes real or not, who cares? We only care about making money. And the only way to make money is the capture a trend. What drives that trend does not matter. Emotions drive the trend, by the way. A lot of great of fools in crypto right now because it's an emotional market. I had one, I forget the percentage change. It might have been 65%, but with leverage, when I woke up this morning, I was up 400% in one. I've since stopped out, which is a bit of a bummer. But that's the type of moves that are possible. And then you know what? It's going to end badly. I can promise you that. All bubbles end badly. Just have a chair ready for when they do. And if you're, if you want, short them. And again, you get we get paid to take risks, right? So experiment with a small account. Now keep in mind that I'm looking for a free roll on these. I'm not looking to get rich. Now I would love. Like that one, I think it was CVX USDT this morning. I was long and got stopped out of today. But I would love to get in one of these and have it become the next Bitcoin. Well, they all think they're going to become the next Bitcoin. So that's probably not going to happen. But I positioned myself for this to happen. Now, my portfolio looked a lot better this morning. And some of these may have stopped out since I made this slide a few hours ago. But let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I have eight long positions on right now that are free rolls, so to speak. So if these things keep on going, then I'm there for the ride. But look at the volatility. This one's down 14%, as you can see when I grab this screenshot. This one I've been in for quite a while. This one's up three or 400% since I've gotten in it. Now I get whacked on a lot of them too, but you just have to be willing to to get whacked and move on.
you have a three week spike up 50 weeks ago that may bump up the the byline also yeah that's an anomaly i haven't wrapped my head around jeff but i'm not going to change the system because it's something that i went public with a few years ago and i want to keep the system pure but you're right that is an anomaly i didn't think about and what jeff's pointing out is you've got a, a closing high here and then a closing high here uh, and then a closing high here and so the line's going down but then you have one higher in between and then when you move the way it looks at it that that line could actually bump up as it the line itself could go up as opposed to going down to meet the price it's something i really really didn't think about but the con the concept is still there though if you're within 10 percent of a an all-time closing high then the market is in pretty good shape yeah good point after that, there's a severe seven-week drop. Yeah, so we'll have to look at the chart, and it, maybe I'll spend some time doing that. Now, if we don't get a signal this week, then next week I'll spend some time fleshing out what Jeff's saying. Good, good point, and that's something that I have seen that happen historically when I went and did the back testing. It was a bit of an anomaly that happens where that buy line could could spike back up or spike down or whatever the case may be. But yeah, we'll take a look at that. Okay, we'll get to those. Thanks for bringing up those examples, Jeff. We'll get to those in one second. All right, let's shift gears. Let's go take a look at crypto real quick. And it's funny, whenever I get all jazzed about crypto, it starts to implode, <laughs> which kind of stinks. So as I've been saying, it's probably not going to work as well. Oh, there, yeah, it's going to work. Here's that CFX, okay? So this thing, oh, look at that. See, that's a bump. See, that, that kind of bumps me out. See, this is this is one of the, state of regrets you get into is that because these things are so volatile you get knocked out and then they go straight back up again so that's kind of interesting and this one i did get like i said this thing was up uh 65 or whatever it was overnight which turned into like a 400 percent move when you factor in liquidity i know it's fuzzy math but it worked but you can see when they're going up like this you want to focus sometimes just on buying the ones that are going straight up and then again using a heavy dose of the money management so these are the um just the general coin some of these you could use margin on and some of them you could use futures on here's the ones i'm long magic op rndr ftm I'm sorry, these are the ones I'm free rolling on, okay? Rosin, but you can see in this case here, you know, this one shot up, hit the IPT, came right back in. So if it drops much further, I'm, I'm out of that one too. Man's another one. I think I bought this one, yeah, back here, okay? So I just bought this one, it was going up. And it's been a pretty bumpy ride on this one. I probably should have gotten stopped out if that's my original buy there. So looks like I'm right about break even on that one. So that's one, that one might need a little intention. Uh, here's one that triggered, I bought it just because it was going up, right? And then look at this spike here, okay? So this is something I haven't solved for just yet. And maybe what I need to do is peel off some, a little bit when it just shoots up 200% overnight or whatever that was. So that's something I hadn't figured out just yet. The beauty is all the concepts carry over and us traders who've been trading stocks and all this other stuff for so many years, we kind of have an unfair advantage because we know how the money management works. We know how the euphoria works. We know how bubbles work. Okay. So we can go in here and take advantage of the situation. And that's why I'm kind of pumped on the crypto again. You hadn't heard me talk about it for a while because crypto died out for a while. This one, you could see I was in this, I've been in this one forever. 0.01 cents. And then it's about a hundred percent move up higher. And I don't think I have a stop in place on this one, but Obviously, if it takes out this pullback and drops much below the 30, I'll probably go ahead and bail on it. I think I bailed on this FET. No, I still have some, I think. I meant to bail on it, I believe. Let me just double check real quick. But I don't remember, I don't have my chart marked up. Matic, this is another one. This is one I bought while I was going up. I'm still long this one and I have a slight profit in it but it hasn't hit the IPTs up here, as you can see. Now, this one, I 
shorted right before the show. I'm actually going to close that out just because on the short side, you got to be a little quicker. You know, I my concern was coming into the show was that crypto would implode while I'm in the show. <laughs> and so I saw these things beginning to implode. Can you put an OCO order in the platform you use? I don't think so. Um, said your stop and set a 200% profit target overnight. Uh, I don't think so. So what I've been doing is just setting a, an order for half to flip them out, okay? And when you're using futures, they have an automatic uh, bailout on you, which I didn't realize. And, and I woke up and did get whacked on one pretty hard the other day. But at least, I hate to say it, at least you have sort of an airbag in place in case um, the SHTF. Sand, am I sure with that one? Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to just shut these down as we go through them. Anyway, any pairs you guys want to look at in particular? And, you know, the short side is kind of more of an experimental type of thing. You know, ideally, what you want to be doing, if you're real familiar with the, with the methodology, is you want to be trading them like the core methodology. You've got a nice thrust high, you've got a nice pullback. The newer pairs sometimes have a lot of uh, euphoria, like IPOs. So that's probably where you want to be, not focused exclusively, but if you see something like this, it looks pretty good. That's also a new one. It might be worth a shot because... Sometimes they'll shoot up two or three hundred percent, and then they'll implode, of course. But at least they'll get moving on that. Okay, any individual ones you guys want to talk about? I'm going to just shut this one down for a two-dollar loss. Mm -hmm. Mana, what's that one doing? Okay, let's go ahead and jump into stocks. It, you know, as you can see, this crypto thing could be a uh, could be a rabbit hole too. If you're not careful, you could end up spending a lot of time messing around with it. So market's been really choppy lately. It has not been kind, very kind to the trend follower. And we'll put the we'll put the 200 and the 50 in here just because of well watch. As I was telling my service peeps tonight, the S&P 500 has pulled back to where it was. A few months ago so that's a bit of a bummer it has worked its way higher it is consolidating in here so as long as it doesn't come unglued and drop below let's say 40 50 it, it looks okay but ideally i'd like to see some follow-through in the uh in the piece so let's take a look at bonds you can see bonds have rolled back over not that you just want to follow the 200 day moving average but as you can see it came up, it kissed that 200 day goodbye. Okay. So the longer term trend of bonds remains down. The dollar has been pulling back in here as of late. That's kind of mucking things up, I think. But the dollar still looks like a top and the dollar still looks like it's in a lot of trouble. NASDAQ got whacked a little today. It looks a little better than the P's. It's had a pretty good run in here, a little bit of a pullback, tried to rally out. They don't make it easy on you, you know. Like uh, Linda, I've got the adages from Linda Rasky, but uh, she said she got them off the floor. But, you know, it's going to do the obvious thing. It's going to rally on this pullback. What it's going to do first, it's going to it's going to give you just enough rally to make you feel good. It's going to sell off hard to make you think it's a failed pullback. And then it's going to take off. Let's see if that's what happens. That's, that'll be fun to watch. I know you want to party with me. Bitcoin was on fire this morning, and then it came back in. I don't know why I didn't show you Bitcoin on the... Uh, on the cash chart. Does anybody know what the discount on this uh, GBTC is? If they truly own the Bitcoin, then this would, this is the bargain of the century at a 40% discount. That's a big if though. <laughs> the discount is uh, was about 40%. So it's an instant 40% gain. It's too bad it doesn't work like, like that. Gold has failed, as you can see. It looks like it's failed. You got a big gap down. Gold doesn't look so hot anymore. Gold was looking pretty good for a while. I'm kind of glad, you know, I kept saying gold looks good, but we don't have any gold stocks setting up or any worth trading. And I'm kind of glad that um, gold imploded before triggering, triggering us into any of those stocks. Energies have lost a lot of steam. They're stalling below these multiple tops in here. A few big updates would make all the difference in the world, but obviously that has to happen. Metals and mining still look pretty good, though. So far, just kind of pulling back, maybe pulling back to kiss the 50 simple moving average. 
goodbye. I know all you guys think I keep looking at the same sectors over and over. I'm looking at all the sectors, but the only ones that that are interesting or ones I think you should be watching at this time, I tend to show over and over again. Drugs are on the cusp of breaking down. As I told my service peeps tonight, if they do break down below this range and then take out the top of the range, that would be very bullish. But for now, they're starting to look a little bearish in here. Looks like they could be rolling over. Biotech is kind of wide and loose. It has worked its way higher, but now it's losing a little steam in here. So in general, yeah, choppy uptrend, but losing steam. So a little concerned about that. M&C stocks have been doing pretty good, as you can see. So that's that's encouraging. A little wide and loose, but working their way higher, as you can see. Leisure stocks have been doing pretty good. I know I don't talk about leisure much, but you can see leisure, leisure stocks have a decent rally, a little overhead supply to overcome. And let's just take a look at the semiconductor. Semis are one of my favorite areas to watch. You can see so far, a nice uptrend remains intact. Today was a little bit of a spanking there, but so far it's kind of making a little flag in here. So far, so good in the semiconductors. Okay, uh, Jeff is saying DDOG. Is that Datadog? DDOG. Okay, maybe Para already get a pullback. Yeah, so I guess if you're, well, this is a, you're talking about for an opening gap reversal. But yeah, this wouldn't be a fantastic setup because it's, it's kind of choppy and all over the place, okay? Um, but I hear you, you know, because it's got a lot of volume. I suppose if you're an aggressive day trader, you can go in and play a little pop, you know, just in and out of this one. And what's the other one? Para, P-A-R-A. Yeah, but see, that's not within a setup. But yeah, I hear what you're saying. So good, good, good point there. You know, nice little opening gap reversal. But ideally, you want to see this bar like down here somewhere within that pullback. Okay. Yeah, and Jeff's point all stuff. Yeah, Jeff knows. He's point all. He's just he's just giving me some examples of some stocks to show. All right, individual stock questions, favorite stock picks. I know we talk about stocks all day in Facebook. We don't get as many in the live shows. But anything you guys want me to cover? I'll close out some uh, shiz coins while you guys are doing that. Start again tomorrow on some of these. Keep my free rolls. All right, on stocks, going once. Got a quiet bunch tonight, going twice. Well, oh, here we go. Gold didn't fail since higher than everything since 2021, but the dollar's retraced so we get a choppy market and lower commodities. I know, uh, boring as hell. At uh, parties, yeah, well, you and I could party together, Craig. <laughs> no, Craig, you're 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 pretty interesting. <laughs> I know, I'm boring as hell at parties. UUP will go to 2850, 200 day moving average. Yeah, UUP is a, uh, as I said earlier, and you kind of put me on that on that a little bit, put me on that dog, so to speak. Uh, but yeah, I, I always watch the dollar, as you probably know. But the dollar is kind of mucking things up quite a bit. All right, I want to thank all you guys for attending. I appreciate you attending the show, obviously. Take your time with your busy schedule. Probably no show next week due to my schedule. Uh, just stay tuned on Facebook. I'll make an announcement there, more than likely. Uh, if we don't talk to you now and then, everybody have a great weekend. And then you guys that are here live tonight, I'll see you tomorrow on Facebook. Thank you so much.